Let's talk about your nickname. I said, hey, I'm going to interview the Angel of Death. I don't know if she likes that or doesn't like that, but it's certainly catchy. Yes, ma'am. You don't, you don't really lose that at any the, point during your career. Uh, I, for years, I did not like to talk about it, believe it or not, um, because I, I prefer to talk about others than myself, and I felt like I was just part of a team. And I was, in this case, and I'll unpack the story for you, in this case, I was being called out for being different. And I was working so hard to just be good at what I did, no matter my gender. Uh, and gender plays into this. But over time, and I talked to you about being personally and professionally confident, um, I realized that that story has had so many unintended second order, second and third order effects, unintended consequences for the positive. So I'll replay it for you. Uh, so to, it's 2001 and this is my first combat mission. So we flew from Hurlburt Field. So we launched from here. We landed in Uzbekistan and Karshi Khan about Uzbekistan. And uh, that we were given about 12 hours is what they need to give uh, air crew for rest. We were called back into a tent and given a call sign, a, free, a radio frequency and a grid, a location of the American forces. Uh, and that was it. That was our mission planning. Uh, we pulled maps out of boxes we charted a, a course from Uzbekistan to Afghanistan border. And then our, my job on, on the AC-130 as the navigator is of course to get our, our airplanes from point A to point B, but we do all the tactical communication. So my job is to, we find the friendly forces and then we get a situation report. So on the radio, I began talking to ODA 595. Uh, which, AKA the horse soldiers. So they were aligned with the Northern Alliance. They were actually just in town last weekend at a uh, remembrance, a 9-11 remembrance in Okaloosa County at the fairgrounds, the Fort Walton Beach fairgrounds. So we just celebrated that. So I, uh, I made contact with them on the radio and got a situation report. And we were told to look for any armor or any enemy personnel. And at that time in Afghanistan, it was dark. Nobody was out at, at night. Um, every, the power was off around the country, so it was pretty easy to see any activity. And when uh, we found some personnel, we found some armor, we were, we were cleared to engage that armor, and we did. As we were continuing to scan the city, again, my job is relaying what we're seeing through our sensors, because then they didn't have the ability to see what we see. So it had to be a play-by-play, -play, a clear depiction of what we were seeing on the ground. Uh, we found uh, a vehicle headed towards the friendly location. So if our job is to protect them, uh, we, they had cleared us to engage that vehicle. Just prior to the engagement, that vehicle pulled into a compound. And that compound had more vehicles and many adult males walking around a small building. And they came back over the radio and they said, you're con those are confirmed Taliban, you're cleared hot. So my first combat mission, I was a lieutenant. I had not been to combat before. And on that crew, we had the young, I would say I was the young, and we had the more senior. The gentleman to my left was a, a, a Lieutenant Colonel in 05 who'd served many years. Uh, we had a senior aircraft commander. We had a young co-pilot. So we were already growing the next, uh, balanced with the experience. So uh, they, can, they cleared us to shoot and we shot 400 rounds of 40 uh, millimeter and, and uh, 100 rounds of 105 millimeter that night, eliminating hundreds of enemy personnel. What we didn't know is when we started to engage that compound, they ha that was a meeting house and they were inside that building. And as the vehicles caught on fire, they began pouring out and we were able to eliminate uh, the enemy. So you asked about the angel of death. Uh, while I'm communicating with the team, General Dostom, who's an Afghan warlord who we aligned with, uh, could hear me on the radio. And he looked at our teammates, our Army Special Forces teammates and said, is that, is that a woman? And they said, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. And he laughed, he couldn't believe it. And he got on his walkie talkie and he called the enemy that we were shooting because they're all linked in some way. And in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, American women are so determined to kill Taliban. Uh, they put them on their airplanes. Or, uh, let me replay that. Uh, he said, America is so determined to kill Taliban, they put their women on warplanes. And as I'm communicating, giving the situation reports, doing my job, he keys the mic so the enemy personnel can hear my voice. At the same time, we were using what we call an ISLID, which is a high-powered laser pointer on the airplane. It's, and you can see it under night vision goggles. 
So we're using that internal deconfliction of where the enemy are moving. And General Dosim sees the same thing. And he says, is that, is that a death ray? And our teammates looked at each other and I said, as a matter of fact, it is. So he, they believe that America had a laser uh, that could point to the ground and, and blow things up, which wasn't the case back then. Uh, so he got on his walkie talkie again, General Dosim and said, uh, you are so pathetic. American women are killing you. The angel of death is raining death and destruction and allowed them to hear my voice. Uh, you must surrender now, which that next morning, uh, I, I don't know how many, but uh, hundreds of them surrendered themselves to General Dostum. So that story of my voice and, and we, we were, he was using it as a disgrace mechanism, gave me a sense of pride. I, I did, we did not know that was happening at the time. So two weeks later, the team, the ODA team, Operational Detachment Alpha, comes back up to Uzbekistan and tells us this story. Uh, and hands me an AK-47 from the Northern Alliance because what we were able to do that night as a crew was a very decisive change in the war in Afghanistan very early on. That weapon is hung at the 16th Special Operations Squadron, the squadron that was part of those missions uh, today as a part of our history. The story gets better. So that was once, you know, poked to the chest to the enemy. Uh, what General Dostum did, uh, a general a warlord essentially, who did not believe probably most of his life that women should be in school, that they should have jobs. He took the story of America allowing their women to fly on airplanes to a burqa unveiling ceremony. It was in a village with young women and he, and he told that story of our support and what we were able to do and, and reminded them that if they, were to, they, would, they would continue to fight against the Taliban and Al Qaeda, uh, that they would have those freedoms one day. Uh, so to make an impact on a warlord uh, uh, for the things that we just get to do here was pretty uh, darn impactful. Next phase of this story, I ran, I was, I had the, uh, the privilege to meet General Dostum's son years later, I think it was about 2011 in New York at the Horse Soldier Memorial that's placed at Ground Zero in Manhattan. And his dad had told him the stories of American women flying on airplanes. I met Afghan women over the years that had heard some portion of that story and how that gave them hope and inspired them. So I went from just wanting to do my job, not wanting to be recognized to, uh, uh, for being any different, specifically as a woman, uh, and embracing it and knowing that if I can share my little piece of the story and that inspires one person, uh, we're winning. I just never looked at myself as, as an inspiration. I just looked at myself as I'm doing my job, I'm answering my calling, my calling from higher.